So we're talking about uh, a series called Money Talks. And uh, you would think it would be a, a series about tithing, but it's not necessarily about tithing. It's about a lot of different things because money talks. Um, in fact, there's a story that I heard about money actually talking. There was a $1 bill, a $20 bill, a $50 bill, and a $100 bill. And they finally ran into each other again. They hadn't seen each other in a while. And they, they were talking and, and stuff. And the $1 bill said, man, I haven't seen you guys in forever, man. What have you been up to? And the 20 said, oh, man, I've been down to Florida. Man, I went down to Florida. Man, it was beautiful down there. It was awesome. Man, it was great. The $50 bill says, oh, man, that's nothing, man. I've been out to Vegas. I went out to Vegas for six weeks. Man, it was awesome out there. It was great. Da, da, da. And the $100 bill said, man, that's nothing, man. I've been on four cruises, and i got two coming up this, this, this next year. Man, it's awesome. It, you got to do this. And somebody, then one of them said, well, what have you been up to, one? He said, oh, you know me, church, church, church. <laughs> money talks. <laughs> What's your money saying? <laughs> so last week, last week we talked about really in, in, this is the fourth week. In week three, we talked about uh, eternal destiny. And uh, that was the main theme of last week's. Uh, and I, I would have to put not just this in this series, but that message of eternal destinies as a, what I would call a top-tier message of importance. Of course, the, the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross and shed his blood for us, and, he, and he, what he offers us in the re- plan of redemption, it's got to be the, the greatest message ever told. But where we're going to spend eternity, man, that's, that's, that's right up there. And uh, so uh, if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to um, go back on our website and, and listen to last week's message because it's important. Because one of the things that we discovered, and we say this, is if, if dying is, is as a certainty, and, and as far as I know, every person that is born dies eventually. I mean, obviously you're not dead yet, but you will. If the Lord tarries his coming, Jesus is coming back for his church, but if he tarries his coming, probably in another, I guess at least, at least probably 80 years, 100 years, everybody in this room will be dead. Would, would you believe that? I mean, those of you that are in your 30s, you're not going to be 130 years old. So, I mean, we're, we're all going to die if Jesus tarries his coming. Some people will die and, and, and go into eternity. Some people will go into eternity when Jesus comes back for his church. But whatever way, death is, death is certain. So it's important to remember this is something that, that, that David said. We read this last week uh, in Psalms, one, Psalms 39. And, and this is something, you know, I don't know. I tried to look up when did they, how old was David when he died. And I don't think the Bible is specific. If, if you find it in there, let me know. But I, don't, I couldn't find it where it's specific. But the theologians believe that it was somewhere between 70 and 80 years of age. And I got to believe somewhere in his 60s or so he would have said this because this is something, this is, this is older person wisdom. This isn't something that our millennials would figure out at this point, really, in their life. This is something that, at my age even, at 61, that mm-hmm, I, could, I, I, I see that. Here's what he said in uh, Psalms, 1, Psalms 39, verse 6. The Passion Translation says, All of our activities and energies are spent for things that pass away. We gather, we hoard, we cling to things, only to leave them all behind for who knows who. Now, again, that's, that's the person that's lived his life, and now he's beginning to really see hopefully begins to see at that point that some things that, again, that are, that are really important. Sometimes the, the only message that, that we hear, uh, even in, in the church, is as far as eternity is, well, you better be ready to meet your maker. You, you, you just better be ready. And again, since the Bible plainly teaches us, plainly teaches us that, that we're going to die because there is life after death, it should influence the way that we live. All the way down to the words that we speak and certainly the actions that we do. We should pay attention and we should be ready and living because there is an eternity coming. Heard the story about two farmers <clears throat> and uh, they, their properties backed up to one another. One was a devout Christian and one was an atheist. And it used to just, it used to just burn the atheist up when he would see the, the Christian farmer out in his field getting his dirt and holding it up to the Lord and praying and singing and worshiping out there. And it just used to aggravate him. So one day he goes up to the, to the, to the uh, Christian farmer and he tells him, he said, look, this year, this come spring, we're going to plant the same number of acres. We're going to plant the same crop which they normally did always anyway. We're going to plant the same crop. You're going to pray to your God to bless yours, and I'm going to curse God. And in October, we're going to see who has the better crop. Well, they did, and come, comes, uh, come October, the, uh, the atheist was proud to know and to see that his crop was a little bit bigger. His crop 
produced a little bit more. And man, he just loved digging it into that, uh, to that devout Christian farmer. And he told him, he said, well, what do you got to say about your God now? He just said, all I got to say is my God don't always settle up in October. <laughs> but he settles up. He settles up. He's going to settle up. Listen, there's a day of reckoning coming. There's a day of reckoning coming. Most Christians live our lives as though the, on the earth as though it's not, this life is not connected with the life in heaven. I'm going to live this life and live to all the gusto that I can get out of it, and then I'm going to go to heaven, and I'm going to enjoy heaven. But remember last week, remember last week we, we heard about two judgments. One judgment that all Christians are going to face, and it's called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ, and it's based on judging us in this life. Not judging us when we get to heaven. How'd you do the last five minutes since you've been here? It is appointed that a man wants to die and then the judgment. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and our life on earth, the way that we did, what we did with all of the things that God gave us, everything that we have. Did you know when you got saved, when you got saved, you give your life to the Lord, right? That's everything. That's your, your, your money, your kids, your family. You, you give everything belongs to him. We raise our children in the admonition and the nurture of the Lord Jesus Christ because we're his and they're his. Is that right? Remember this from last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, for, for, one day, for one day we will all be openly revealed before Christ on his throne so that each of us will be duly recompensed. Duly recompensed means you'll be duly uh, paid. You'll do, be duly uh, Im, uh, Get paydays coming one day, recompense for, for all of your actions done in this life, whether good or worthless. There's good and there's worthless. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he reap. And then we read over in 1 Corinthians, the verse that tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that the quality of our works, the quality of the things that we do will be judged. And then it'll be judged by fire. And it says if our works are, are, and it gives the analogy of gold and silver and precious or costly stones, or our works wood, hay, and stubble, or our works done with fleshly, selfish motives. Again, if they're done with, with, with their good works, their godly works, they were done with, with God in mind, then they're gold, they're silver, and they're precious stone. It says you'll be rewarded for that. But if the works are, are, are fleshly, if they're carnal, if they're just done selfishly, sometimes, you know, you, you did everything for, 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 you know, hey, I went down and I cleaned up the church today, everybody. Just want everybody to know I, I cleaned up the church. You know, that's why when he says, you know, when you fast, wash your face, comb your hair. Don't go, oh, praise God. I'm fasting today. Oh, you're so spiritual. When you pray, go into your closet. Don't go out on the street corner. Oh, my Lord God. Go into your closet and pray. And when you give, you don't have to write four-foot checks. <laughs> Praise God, this is what I gave to the building fund. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give them a hand. Come on, let's give them a hand. Because this is all the reward they're going to get. So let's give them a good one. That's the reward right there. For your work, your work, if it stands the test of fire, it will be rewarded, it says. And if our works, our actions consumed by fire, if they're wood, uh, hay, and, and stubble, they're going to be consumed by fire. And listen, then it goes on to say this, but we will suffer great loss if that happens, but yet you'll be one who barely escaped destruction. In other words, you, you'll still be saved. You're, it's kind of like sliding into home plate and having to do the replay to see, to see was he saved, was he tagged, did you make it, oh, you made it. How many of you believe that's the will of God, that we slide into heaven, we just make it? Listen, but know this, God promises great reward. God promises great reward for serving him with faithfulness and obedience. In fact, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, it says that he'll a hundredfold return. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good percentage, a hundredfold return. So today, you know, this is to me, this is the beauty of pastoring. You know, if I was an evangelist and I came here last week and I shared that message with you about eternity, I'd blow in, blow up, and blow out. But this week, after last week, I just, you know, I'm kind of going in, in the direction for, the, for this week. I just, I want to go a little bit deeper. I want to go a little bit further. And th that's the good thing about being pastor. And I'll be here next Sunday too, by the way. <laughs> Love being able to follow and obey God. Don't have to get it all in one lump. So I want to share some things with you. I want to talk about what does the Bible say about crowns? 
What's the Bible say about crowns? What about rewards? What about positions of leadership? What does the Bible say about that? What does it say about eternal differences? Are we, when we get to heaven, are we, are we all the same? Do we all just get, you know, get fitted with a, ro- a white robe and we just walk around, we all look the same? But let's look for first, let's look at rewards. There's five crowns that are mentioned, five crowns that are mentioned in the New Testament. And let's look at these right quick. I'll just name them and I'll, I'll give you a verse to kind of to prove where, where we find them. The first one is the crown of life. A crown of life, and we see this in James. We see it also in, in Revelation. James chapter 1, verse 12 says this, God bless those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive, here it is, the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Also, it says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer, for the devil will throw some of you into prison and test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but watch this, but if you remain faithful, even when you're facing death, I'll give you the crown of life. So obviously, this crown is for remaining faithful to Christ, remaining faithful to Christ through persecution and even through martyrdom. You know, when I think of martyrdom, I think of, you know, I, my, my mind goes back to that image on Facebook uh, where they put the, the uh, ISIS soldiers were killing the, the Christians and cutting their heads off. And, you know, and we, we hear stories of where people go in, in in different countries, thank God not here, not yet, uh, telling people to renounce Christ, and they refuse to, and they kill them uh, for doing that. For, for, they kill them for not renouncing Christ. They get the crown of life. The next crown that we see is the imperishable crown. The, the New King James Version calls it the imperishable crown, the, the the, um, the NIV version calls it the crown that will last forever, imperishable. In other words, it's not going to perish, it's, it's imperishable, it'll last forever. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that those who run the race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate. Temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown crown, one that will never be destroyed. This one, this crown is for determination and discipline and, and perseverance, living a victorious Christian life. You will receive, you will receive the imperishable crown. The third crown that's talked about is the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing. Another place I've seen it, another translation I've heard it say the, pr- the crown of joy. Philippians chapter 4, 1 first, first Thessalonians. Philippians 4, 1 says this, therefore my brothers, he's, who is he talking to? Paul's talking to the church at Philippi. So he's talking to the believers there at Philippi. He said, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. He's telling them that they are his joy and his crown. Stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. And he's saying, in essence, almost the same thing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting? What is our crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus is coming? Is it not you? And it is them. That was, that's what it was. So this crown is for pouring yourself into other people through evangelism and through discipleship. When you, when you go out and you win people to the Lord, you share people and you bring them into the kingdom and you mentor and you disciple and you bring people along, this is the crown that you get for that, the crown of rejoicing. The fourth crown is the crown of glory. See this in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter, one, uh, chapter 5 verse 1 says, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, and the one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Verse 2 says this, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under you and under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money. That tells us that, that those in leadership positions like that over the flock, that if they're greedy for money, then they disqualify themselves from receiving this crown. So not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd uh, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And then the last crown, well, let me tell you what that one's for. That one's for, for faithfully representing Christ in positions of spiritual leadership. The crown of righteousness is the last one, 2 Timothy chapter 4. For I am ready, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is stored up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. But not only for me, but all, all, all who long, all who have longed for his appearing. This crown is for joyfully purifying ourselves uh, and getting ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ.
So there's no indication in the Bible that these are the only five crowns, but these are the five that, that are mentioned. I, bet there's, I would imagine there's other rewards, probably other crowns and things, but I don't think it's going to be, everybody gets a crown, everybody line up and get your reward today. You know, I, don't think it's, I don't think it'll be like that. But here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing about these crowns and why it's so wrong to say, I don't, I don't really want a crown. I just, it's just enough that I can just be with Jesus. It sounds, it sounds really good, but here's the thing. What we miss is this. When we earn those crowns, when we earn those things, when we do those things that would earn those things, it brings Christ glory. The thing that you do, go back and look at every one of those things that you get for doing those things and doing those things, it brings Christ glory and he wants to give you a crown. Listen to what it says. And it's something else, too, we can learn is if maybe we can learn something from the 24 elders that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 4. We can learn what they did with their crowns, and it may kind of give us a clue what we can do with ours. It says this in verse 10, Revelation 4, 10, uh, NIV. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever. And watch this. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord. And God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have, and, and have their being. So listen, man, we can take those crowns and have something to lay at the feet of Jesus. So again, false humility says, I don't want anything, don't, don't give me anything. It's effectively saying, I don't want to have anything to lay at the feet of Jesus. I'd just be happy being in heaven. <laughs> listen, anybody ever, anybody ever irritated you? Besides, I'm talking about besides me. <laughs> Anybody ever irritated you? You ever heard this say, they, boy, they just get your goat? Yeah. Boy, they just, know, they just know how to, you know what they are? They're called EGRs. You know what EGRs is? Anybody know what that is? Tell me if you know what it is, EGR. They're an EGR person. Extra grace required. To be around them, you've got to have extra grace. Anybody got any EGR people in your life? <laughs> Listen, the Bible tells us to hold fast. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, it says, hold fast to that which we have. In other words, what do we have? We have our testimony. We have the, the fruit of the Spirit. We have the love of God on the inside of us. When you got born again, the love, God gave you the love of God, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. It's on the inside of you. You've got the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, temperance, self-control. You've got all of those things. Hold on to those things. Hold on to things. Don't let anyone get you. I, I think sometimes the enemy sends people around us just, just to get our goat, doesn't he? Well, I've got news for you. I wouldn't surprise me if God doesn't send a few people like that. Hello? God sends people, I think, sometimes to, to see how much grace we've got. See if we're walking it. It's good to talk about it and teach on it and preach on it, but you've got to live it. Amen? Listen, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul's talking about running the race. He's talking about being disciplined. Here's what it says, 1 Corinthians 9.27 says, no, I beat my body. I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself might not be disqualified for the prize. You know what he's talking about there? He's talking about hypocrisy. I don't preach to everybody else to do this, and then I go do something else myself. That's called hypocrisy, and it's ugly. We've all been around people who are like that, right? They go around, they tell us one thing, but then you see them doing something else. That's ugly. It's just nasty to be around. Listen, you can do the right thing. You can do godly things, but if you do it for selfish fleshly reasons, then there will be no reward for that. There'll be no blessing come out of that. Second John, in Second John, he's talking about, he's talking to the elect lady, whoever the elect lady is, and her children. And here's what he says. He talks about, tells her to walk in love, to hold the right teaching, to, to, to don't be deceived because there's, some, there's people there that were trying to deceive her about the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ not taking place. And here's what he says in verse 8, Second John verse 8. There's only one chapter, so there's only one eight in it. It says, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you've worked hard for, but may be, have a full reward. Have a full reward. In other words, don't lose your rewards. Don't lose it. Don't let people, EGR people that need, you know, they need more grace or people that are, you get around and they, they give you false, talk, false doctrine. Don't believe those things. 
Let's look for just a moment about, about rewards and about positions, about the eternal differences in heaven. I think that there's a misconception that people, that Christians have of, of we'll live our lives down here and however we are, and then when we all get to heaven, we'll all be the same. Like I said in the beginning, you know, we'll, we'll all get fitted for our robes and we'll all go, uh, go, go around. I remember when I went in the, uh, in the Air Force, one of the first things they did after we got there, got off the bus, and uh, we, they took us down and um, we went down and got our, got our uh, uniforms got our costumes, I should say. Now, I went and got our, got our uniforms, and I got four pair of pants, four shirts, underwear, all this stuff, put our clothes in, in a suitcase, took it back and put it in a, in a storage room. Then the next thing that we did, we went and got our hair cut. Now, let me tell you, man, there was all kind of people in, in, in uh, when I was in. I mean, you know, they had long hair. And they, there were some big afros. There were some long locks. There were some all these kind of different things. So here we are. We got all, everybody else in our green uniforms. We all get our, go in there and get our head shaved. We're all bald-headed. We walked out of there and looked like a bunch of green pickles. <laughs> you know what they did? They put us all on the same level. I mean, we all looked the same. The only thing different, of course, maybe might have been the tone of our skin, but uh, our name on our shirt, but everything else, man, we, we, were, we were all the same. And I think some people had that image of that's what heaven is going to be like. We're all going to get up there and get fitted for a robe and all just have this glory on us and things. But listen, I'm not so sure that every believer will hear these words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I don't believe that they will. I mean, I, I, let, let me use an extreme example. You, you use a, a Mother Teresa or a Billy Graham and uh, that, that gave their life serving the Lord and won you know, millions of people, perhaps, to the Lord, and then somebody that got saved on his deathbed. You know, somebody that lived their life for themselves and more just at the last minute, boy, they, they slid in under the door. I don't think they'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, that, that Billy Graham and Mother Teresa would hear. Amen? There's a great likelihood that there'll be believers in heaven who won't have very, they'll have very little treasure. They'll have very little reward in heaven. Different levels in heaven depending on what you stored up. The scripture suggests that, uh, that there'll be some that'll be ashamed at Christ's coming. First, Corinth, uh, First, John, First John chapter 2 verse 28. First John 2 28 says this, And now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. I believe there will be Christians in heaven that will be shamed. Again, like I said last week, I, you know, when the scripture says he'll wipe away all of our tears, you know, what are those tears? You know, I, I, I think it'll be, personally, I think that it'll be tears of perhaps tears of regret, tears of, of people that I went to school with, people that I, I worked with, not necessarily here at the church. I hope they're all saved. Aren't they, Jackie? <laughs> Jackie says she's not sure either. <laughs> But some of the people that you work with, people in our neighborhoods, people that we, we live with, that we see waitresses, that we see waiters that we see at different restaurants, we know them, we have a relationship with them, but now we find out that they, they're not in heaven, they're in an eternal a place called hell. I think that would, be, that would be very hard. Maybe even loved ones that we thought were saved, that, that we hoped that they were. They didn't really show any evidence down here, but we just, you know, everybody that's good, you know, they're good, so everybody good, that's good goes to heaven, right? Well, that's what Hollywood tells us, you know. Everybody that's good, everybody, well they're, well, they're in a better place. Is that right? I heard about, I heard about the true, true story. The church that I was in up in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, was a very high mafia area uh, because it was halfway in between uh, New York and halfway in between, was it Chicago? It was halfway in between, so it was a good place for, for the mafia to, to go in between the two. So there was a lot of activity there. And there was one guy that, that died, and uh, he, was, he, was a, he was a mafia guy. And at his funeral, they preach, you know, he's in a better place. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing what people cling to, but what does the Word of God say? But I think there will be some people that, you know, honest to, honest to God, I, 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 I pray and I hope that my dad is in heaven. Uh, he, said that he said that he prayed a, a prayer when he was young. Uh, and the, the, my next door neighbor's son-in-law was a pastor. When my dad was sick and he was dying, he said he prayed with my dad uh, too. And so I just, I just hope. You know, my dad asked. Me, I would, I would, when my dad was dying, I talked to him a lot about eternity and, and, and stuff. And he asked me, he said, "What have I done that's so bad that makes you think that I'm that I'm lost, that I'm that I'm not saved?" And I said, "Well, Dad, I just said I don't, I just don't know. I just want to make sure. I want to make sure you're there." And uh, so, you know, there's, there's people that, that we hope, that we, we believe, you know, that they're there, but perhaps maybe they're, they're not. I don't know. So anyway, God says he'll wipe, away all, he'll wipe away all of our tears. 
But listen, the tangible results, the tangible results of those who faithfully serve Christ in this life and those who haven't will be evident to all eternity. It'll be evident, those who have and those who, 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 who haven't. Well, what will be the evidence of it? What will be the evidence of it? It will be demonstrated by the possessions and the, and the, and the, uh, the possessions and the positions that they have in heaven. And it'll differ significantly, I believe, the Bible teaches from person to person. According to Matthew chapter 25, it says that some will be put in, some will be put in charge of many things. And it's based upon their stewardship. It's based upon our faithfulness to him. Luke 19 says that some will be governors over ten cities. Some will be governors over five cities. Some will be governors over no cities. There's different positions, different places. Again, it's based on what we do in this life of our faithfulness and our stewardship. Stewardship is all about the heart. Again, you go back to the widow with the issue of blood. It wasn't about how much she put in. It was about her heart. It wasn't about how much the, the big checks that they put in the offering. The, the, those, again, it was a, it's a hard issue. You know, last week we saw this, that hell is a terrible place. It's a terrible place, and it'll be worse for us some than it is for others. You know, Jesus said, woe to you, Corazon, woe to you, Capernaum. If the things had been done, if the signs had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would still be here today. It's going to be worse for Capernaum than it is Sodom and Gomorrah. It would stand to reason that hell is a wonderful place. It's going to be more wonderful for some than it is others. But listen, even the even the, the, the bottom level, the bottom level of hell of heaven sure beats going to hell, doesn't it? Amen. Scripture is very clear, very clear that there is a payback. There's a payback in heaven. And it's important that we understand that as far as in regards to our salvation, it's based on the work of Christ. It's not based on any works that you do, it's not based on how good you are. It's totally based on Jesus Christ. We got that? Amen. And then there are rewards. They're due to our works. Our salvation is based on the work of Christ. Our rewards and, and things like that are based, and our positions are based on the things that we do in this life. It's imperative that we learn that we know to trust in Christ, to lean on Christ, to draw, to draw upon Christ. For without him, we can do nothing. We can do nothing without him. I mean nothing. Without him giving our bodies the, the brains to breathe, we wouldn't even know how to breathe air. God created us. He created our bodies. And it's imperative that we know we must trust in him. Listen, if we hope to receive rewards, though, there's necessary that we work. The old timers made up this saying or had this saying. It's this, we must bear the cross if we want to wear the crown. Listen, our beliefs, I'm going to say this again, our beliefs and our trust determines our eternal destination. Where we'll be, our behavior, our obedience determines our eternal rewards, what we'll have when we're there. Now, again, I think some Christians that, some Christians that feel being motivated by, by getting rewards, to get rewards for doing things that we, that we should do anyway because we love him, they just have a hard time with that. And again, I said, don't get in the false humility of saying, you know, it's, I don't want anything, it's just, just enough to be with Jesus. Listen, there's been times when I've told my kids, hey, if you'll do such and such, I'll give you $20. I'll give you $50. Hey, Hunter Barrett or something, one of my boys, he said, hey, clean out the gutters around the house and I'll give you $50. And the reason I do that is because I know they're going to school. There's things that they would like to buy, things, places they would like to go. And they don't have, they're not, you know, they don't have it. So I want them. Why would I do that? Because I love them and I want to give it to them. But I want them to earn it. So is it wrong for them to, to want to be rewarded for work that I promised that I would give them? No, of course it's not. Is it wrong if I say, hey, you go do that work and I'll take you out to lunch afterwards? Would it be wrong for them to want to go to lunch afterwards for what they did? No. Of course not. Listen, I want, I want them. I want them to want that. I want them to want what I offer them. Now, it would be inappropriate if I asked them to do something and they said, well, how much will you pay me? Now, that's a different animal. That's a hard issue. But if I say, hey, how about doing this and I'll give you this? It's, I'm doing that because I love them and I want to bless them. Yes. It's my idea. Listen, again, I think we flatter ourselves when we tell God, nah, it's all right. I don't want it. I don't, I don't, I don't want what you're wanting. To. God wants to bless you. Amen. He wants to give you. He loves you. Listen to what the Bible says about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26. It says, he thought that it was better to suffer for the sakes of, of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. 
For he was looking ahead for what? To the great reward. He was looking ahead to the prize. Paul said he ran his eyes, he ran his race with his eyes on the prize. Here's another model. Here's another person that was motivated by reward, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. You know what the joy that was set before him was? It was you. It was me. It was us. We were the joy that was set before him. If he died on the cross, then he would get to spend eternity with us in heaven. He endured the cross for the joy, for the prize that was set in front of him. Watch this. It tells us, Luke tells us about Jesus. Luke 6, 35, he says, but love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Love your enemies, do good and lend, talking about to your, to your enemies, it says, expecting nothing in return, nothing from them. Hello? Nothing from them, because he goes on to say this, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Don't expect anything in return from them, but hey, I'll reward you. God wants to. He wants to do that. God wants us to be motivated by the amazing offers that he wants to bless us with. What motivates God to want to bless us? What in the world would motivate God to want to bless us, to reward us? I'll tell you what it is. It's our faith and our obedience. Our faith and our obedience. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 says this. If you're willing and obedient. Anybody remember what that says? What will happen? You'll eat the good of the land. If you're willing and obedient. You'll eat the good of the land. I love something that Smith Wilgersworth said. He said, God will pass over a million people praying to get that one person who's praying in faith. You know, you can pray and you're not praying in faith. You're not believing God. You're just praying. You're just asking God for things. But the, the one who's praying in faith, God will pass over a million people to get to that one. I like that. Watch this. You know, a lot of people are in this room today are probably very familiar with this, this passage of Scripture, Malachi chapter 3. It says, bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me and put me to a test. Listen to what God's saying here. Therefore, by, thereby put me to a test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out for you a blessing until there is no more need, until there's no more need for it. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that, I, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Listen, the uniqueness of this promise, the uniqueness of this challenge that God gives is not only is there a, a future blessing in heaven, but there's a blessing now. Notice again, he says, there it will not destroy your fruit of your soil, not the soil in heaven, the soil down here. Did you know that your, ki that your kids are your seed? Hello? Your, God will not let your seed be destroyed. You know, remember God said, you know, I, I gave the illustration about I want, I, I give my kids, I want to do things for them. Again, I want them to, I want them to want what I, what I'm offering them. Listen to what it says, notice again what it says here in Malachi, that God is trying to, he's trying to motivate, he's trying to, to persuade, he's trying to provoke them uh, to do something that they're supposed to be doing in the first place. Remember, they, they did this when God you know, talked about the, uh, the tithe. They were doing that, and then all of a sudden, they kind of got away from it. And now God's out of his love for them. He says, I want to bless you. I want to test me in this. Put me to a test in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you. It says in Leviticus 27, verse 30, it says, every tithe. Tithe means what? Tenth. Tithe means tenth of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees is the Lord's. It is holy. The word holy is the Hebrew word godesh, and it means set apart. So he's saying that the tithe is set apart to the Lord. Today, I think a lot of times the term tithing is, is, is often misused. It's, it's used erroneously by a lot of people when it comes to giving. You know, someone will say, you know, well, I made $2,000 uh, last month, and I tithe $50. You can't tithe $50. What would be a tithe off $2,000? $200. Listen, you can give, you can give, you can give, a, you can, you can donate, you can donate 2%, 4%, 6% of your income, but you can't tithe it. You can't tithe 2%. You can't do that any more than you can whitewash a fence with red paint. It's impossible. You can't tithe because tithe is 10%. Not 6%, not 8%, it's tithe. Remember he said in Malachi, he said, bring the full tithe into my storehouse, not a portion of it. 
If he said bring anywhere between, anywhere between 1% and, and, uh, and 10%, then you could tithe 2%. But you can't tithe 2% any more than you can whitewash a fence with red paint. Put that in your brain. Listen, God said anything less than what he considered the tithe, anything less than 10%, he says, is robbing me. And here's the key. Here's the key to tithing that a lot of Christians don't understand. It's not any 10%. It's not just any 10%. It's not taking, when we get paid, we give him 10%. It's not like after, after I paid all of my bills and gone and got groceries, okay, I've got plenty left over, I'm going to give him 10%. It's the first. It's the first 10%. Why is it the first? Because it's, I mean, why, is it, why does it have to be the first? Because it's the first. Listen, tithe denotes the amount. First, first or first fruit denotes the nature of the offering. Tithe denotes the amount. First fruit denotes the nature of the offering. Deuteronomy says this. Deuteronomy 14, 23 says, The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. The purpose of tithing. God instituted tithing to remind us to always put Him first. First in our life. In the Word of God, there's a, there's a law or a principle. It's called the principle of the first. It's the first fruit. It's the first lamb. Proverbs chapter 3 Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all of your produce. Again, notice it doesn't just say, Honor the Lord with, the, with your wealth and with some of your money. No, it's with the first of your produce. And then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will burst with wine. Listen, remember when Israel, remember when Israel was, was uh, going in, uh, they'd come out of Egypt, and they, they were in the wilderness, and now they're getting ready to go into the, to the promised land, into the land of Canaan. Remember, they, they, they faced a, a battle, uh, a city, had massive walls around it. Anybody remember the name of that? Jericho, thank you. It was the walls of Jericho, massive walls, un, un, impenetrable by, by human standards. And God told them, he told them, he said, go in here, I'm going to do this. He told them to walk around the walls one time for six days. So that's six times around that wall in six days. And on the seventh day, walk around it seven times and then shout. He says, and I'll bring the walls down. And God did. But he gave them this instructions. He said, everything in that city, everything, the gold, the silver, it's any precious stones, bring them. Bring them into the treasury. Bring them into, because they are, he said, they're godesh. What does godesh mean? It means set apart. It's set apart for me. And so sure enough, everything happened just like God said it would. But all of a sudden, there was a man named Achan. Achan took some of the things. My God, how much could it have been? How much could one man carry off in all of that huge city? Could have been much more in a bag. Even if he put it on a donkey. I mean, even a man on a donkey couldn't carry that much. Come on. But God said everything belongs. So the next city they come up against, you want to spell this right, it's a city called Ai. I'll tell you how to spell it. Write this down. It's spelled Ai. It was the city of Ai, and it was, it was a small thing. It would be like the, the Kansas Super Bowl, uh, Kansas City Chiefs facing Williams High School in a battle. It's almost like we'll send the cooks, uh, we'll send the, you know, whoever, just, just go, go down there and, and, and defeat this place. But they came back, Israel came back, their armies came back with their tail between their legs. Thirty men lost their lives. Thirty men were, thirty families were without their dad, without their husband, because they, because one man disobeyed. And Joshua is crying, and he's crying, oh, wow, God, why did you bring us out? And you, we can't even defeat this little city. How are we going to do these other things? Da, da, da. And he says, shut up, stop sniveling. He said, there's sin in the camp. I told you to, the things that were set aside for me to be and brought into my treasury not to touch. Someone did. So you remember what they did? Remember there's 12. I don't have, I need some hands. I got, I got two toes sticking up. Right, thank you. 12. There's 12 tribes. They marched them through before the, the judges. They marched them through tribe by tribe by tribe. And the tribe that Achan was a part of comes through and they said, whoop, it's in this tribe. All you others are dismissed. Now back up. Come through family by family. And they came through family by family and all of a sudden Achan's family come there and they said, stop. It's you. Why have you done this? Anybody remember what they did to Achan? They stoned him. They stoned his family, stoned his kids, burned them all. Man, that seemed kind of that seemed kind of hard. Sometimes we want to question God. Never get on the side where we question Him. If God does something, it's right. <laughs> But it's because they took something of they took something of that that was set apart and it put a curse on them. When they got it right, they went on. Interestingly enough, 
Jericho was the first of, guess how many cities that Israel faced going into the promised land? Ten. Jericho was the first. It was the tithe. It was the one, again, that was set apart. Listen, this series is called Money Talks, and man does it ever. Our actions talk, our money talks, our heart talks, our actions talk. All of these things talk. Our stewardship is certainly a hard issue. It's an obedience issue. But there is a wonderful, wonderful payoff on this side of eternity. On, over there, when we cross over, when we get out of our dot. There's a blessing here and now, but when we get there, let's live for the line. Live for the line and not live for the dot with our things. Let's all stand. Praise God. Let's just tell the Lord for just a moment how much we love Him. Say it out of your mouth, just in conversational tone. Lord, I love you today. I thank you. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I just encourage you to say, this, this series is about, again, anything that we preach and teach is, 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 let's ask ourselves, what's going on in our life? God, is there anything in my life that's not surrendering to you? God, what am I doing? Listen, if you're not tithing, that's, tithing is the training wheels. It's the training wheels of giving. You know, he said, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. So it wasn't just the tithe, but there's offerings. There was different offerings that they had. 10% is set apart for God. And God says that if we, when we do that, when we give him first and give him what's his in the tithe, he says he'll bless that there's a blessing on the other 90%. And we can live off that 90%, but God wants us not to be foolish with that because it belongs to him as well. Some people think that the, the tithe belongs to God, but 100% of it belongs to God. It's really all his. He just says, bring the tithe into the storehouse into your local church he says and then I'll bless I'll bless the other 90% that you live on there'll be a blessing on it Father we thank you today thank you thank you thank you thank you Father thank you Lord Jesus God we bless you today we thank you God thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding help us to see and understand these truths oh God help us to be people that live for eternity and not live for now God, Lord, our hearts and our eyes be on you. Give us wisdom. Give us wisdom with our resources. Give us wisdom with our possessions. Everything, God, it all belongs to you. We bless you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.